Here in the Northern Rockies, dark winter months are outlasted in basements, dens, and nooks, where kindred souls gather together to share intel, swap fly patterns, and relive the memories from seasons past. This gathering spot, known locally as the February Room, is the inspiration for this podcast. No matter the season, the door is always open to those with a fly fishing story to tell. Brought to you by CD Fishing USA, the North American distributor for composite development fly rods and accessories. 40 years of Kiwi ingenuity and graphite technology now available at cd-fishing.us or your local CD USA dealer. Follow us on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook. And remember to go fishing. Here's your host, the Carnops, and this is the February Room. What makes a great fly fishing town? To my mind, proximity to a diversity of fishing opportunities is paramount. Add in the opportunity for seclusion and a community of like-minded folks who share intel and voila, you have a home base suitable for a fly angler. By this definition, Houston, Texas has every right to lay claim as a fly fishing town as my hometown of Missoula, Montana. In fact, Houston boasts over 2,500 miles of waterways, and as we're about to learn, there's far more fly fishing opportunity in the country's fourth largest metropolitan area than most residents and visitors realize. If you have business in Houston, pack your fly rod and grab a copy of Fly Fishing Houston in Southeastern Texas, written by my guest, Robert McConnell. Robert, welcome to the February Room. Hi, Justin. Thanks for having me. You bet. Uh, we're we're excited to talk about this book today. Uh, but first of all, do you have a fishing story you could lay on me? Yeah, yeah. I've got uh, I've got a fishing story. Um, but let me just tell you that the guests that you guys have had on uh, before with the their fishing stories, um, this one this one might pale in comparison because you guys have some have some great stories on this podcast. Oh, we so. appreciate that. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so um, basically when my wife and I first moved down to Houston, Texas, we, we moved from a rural area in northern Pennsylvania, and we moved down to the fourth largest city in the country. And so, you know, we, there were a lot of changes that were going on. We didn't, we weren't really used to the urban lifestyle so much. So at no point did I ever think that I could actually just go fishing in the fourth largest city in the in the country. So um there was a bike trail that wasn't too far from our apartment. And uh, one day I was just riding my bike down this, this bike path. And for a portion of it, it bordered a ditch. And the ditch was maybe, I don't know, three feet wide and three to four feet deep. And as I was paddling, or as I was pedaling along, I looked over and I saw a bunch of cormorants in the ditch. And I... Hmm put the brakes on my bike and I got off and I just was kind of watching these cormorants because I was kind of up above them. I was on the bank and I was kind of looking down in the water and I would just watch them dive under the surface and they'd swim the length of this ditch like torpedoes. Mm -hmm. And then they'd pop up on the other side and they would have a bluegill or a green sunfish in their mouth. I think it was green sunfish. And, um, uh, I was just thinking, Oh, oh my gosh. And, um, I just watched these cormorants do this for, I don't know, 10 minutes. And they were like just eating green sunfish after green sunfish. And I was thinking how many fish can actually be in this <laughs> tiny little ditch. And um, so, you know, eventually the, the cormorants took off and I was thinking, okay, that was crazy. So the next day I came back and I had my three weight with me, which was my brook trout rod that I'd use in Northern Pennsylvania. And, um, and I only had like brook trout flies or whatever. So I just, I tied on a Royal wolf or whatever it was. And, um, there was a culvert that kind of went into this ditch and I was figuring, okay, if any of these greenies had survived that, um, that massacre <laughs> by these cormorants, they probably went into this, uh, culvert that was protruding into this ditch. So I cast my Royal wolf out there and whenever it went floating by the mouth of this culvert, I just watched this green sunfish come out and eat this fly. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know, I caught a dozen of them or whatever it was from that ditch. And that, that was the first thing that told me that I was, I was missing something, you know, that I had been missing something that, that if there were that many fish in this tiny little ditch in, you know, 
Houston metro area, like what other waterways had fish? And then as, as time went on and I started realizing that there was this whole ecosystem that was right under my feet, I had no idea. I started looking at the water more and paying attention to it more and realizing that, okay, there's a carp right there that's rising. Okay. That's a gar that's breaching. Um, I began to see bass that were in the shallows along weedy ditches and, and it just opened up this whole different, uh, idea of, of this urban fishing that I didn't know existed before. So that was a lot of fun to discover that. Yeah. How, for yeah, myself. How cool. Um, here you probably were somewhat lamenting leaving, um, your home where you grew up fly fishing and, uh, and yeah. thought that maybe like that chapter of your life, um, wasn't over, but, um, you know, was kind of on hold for a little bit. Um, and that wasn't the case at all. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I was thinking, oh man, I'm going to be, I'm going to be fly fishing, you know, twice a year, whatever, whenever I go home or whenever I go to New Mexico or, or Colorado or something on, on vacation. Um, but you know, little did I know that once I started getting into the urban thing, uh, there were people that had been fly fishing in Houston for, you know, a long time. Like, uh, one of the, we, I call him the godfather of urban carping, but his name's Mark Marmon. You know, he's been guiding carp fishing in the Houston ditches since the late seventies. Oh, wow. So, you know, guys like that have just been around for forever. And it just, you know, I had to discover it for myself before I realized that there was this whole world that I had been missing out on. So, well, yeah, that's how that stuff usually seems to work. Um, yeah, yeah, that's cool. Um, so, uh, as you mentioned, you grew up fly fishing in, uh, the mountains of Pennsylvania and that's the Allegheny mountains. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's right. So, um, I didn't really get into fly fishing until I had graduated, uh, college and I moved to Northern Pennsylvania and, um, uh, I was working for a, a gas drilling company up there at the time. And, um, uh, on the weekends, you know, we, butted up against the westernmost band of the Appalachians. So that would be the Alleghenies. And, and um, uh, just, I started blue lining and I just fell in love with that exploratory aspect of, of fishing. You know, I just, I loved looking at the topo maps and saying, okay, which Creek am I going to go to this weekend? And just, you know, going out and catching native fish um, native brookies and, and just making a weekend of it. You know, sometimes I'd be there, sometimes I wouldn't, but that was the, that was the exploratory nature of blue lining. And like, that's, that's what really got me, uh, into, into fly fishing was that exploratory aspect. And so blue lining is just simply the act of finding the blue lines on the, on the, uh, topographic USGS map or whatever, and then going and exploring with the fly right. rod. Yep. Yep. That's right. Cool. Was there a, like a particular moment or a fishing trip that you can recall, um, from Pennsylvania where, um, you, you know, the light kind of, kind of went on and it, it, you felt like it sent you down this lifelong path or, you know, when did the fly fishing bug really bite you? Was there a, was there a key moment or did it just kind of develop over time? Yeah, I would, I would say that it was the, the moment that, that I, that I realized, um, kind of the strategy behind fly fishing was, um, there, there was a friend that I had and he was, he was a bit older than I was. He was a, um, he was a high school teacher and he lived in one of the neighboring towns. And one of my friends, uh, was friends with him. And so she connected us and, um, his name was Pete and Pete had been a lifelong, uh, fly fisherman and he would go um, down and fish all those spring creeks down in the state college area. And so he basically just said, you know, hey, I know that you've been really into this. Why don't you come with me and I'll kind of show you what I know. Because, uh, you know, he had a, had a lifetime experience with it. And um, going down there and fishing Spring Creek with him in the Belfont area, just that completely, like, we only made one trip together and I still pull from all those things that he taught me on that day. Um, you know, just how to approach water, how to read water, um, how not to spook the fish, you know, when you're, when you're approaching pools, um, you know, keep your, just, you know, standing in the riffle and you have a, a pool up above you that you can see fish in or that you know that they're, they're in there and just how to approach that pool without sending a wave through it, without alerting them that you're coming. It was, 
yeah, that that whole whole experience of that day just really opened my eyes to to the strategy behind fly fishing, and that was a lot of fun. And I was able to take that and you know apply it to the to the brook trout streams and 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 really started uh, yeah just understanding more about about fishing. And I'm sure that that skill set probably then also translated to what you're doing now in Texas of you know sneaking up on oh yeah on bass or carp or whatever in um, the waterways around the, the Houston metropolitan area. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, there's there's a whole there's a whole section of of this area called the Piney Woods that exists just north of the city, um, and it is a pine forest. Um, it's uh, uh, a large a large chunk of it um, that we that we have access to, and that is our wilderness area, so to speak, is Sam Houston National Forest. And um, in in within Sam Houston National Forest, there are all these little tiny creeks. And you can have blue lining adventures, you know, in the same aspect that you would go out blue lining looking for for brook trout um, in the Appalachians. You can have that same blue lining experience in the Piney Woods region. Um, cool. So yeah, those same those same philosophies um, apply with you know how to how to approach water and how to stay, um, you, you know, uh, stealthy and and all that stuff. You know, you're not going to be you're not fishing for for brookies, obviously, when you're up in the piney woods, but you know you're fishing for all these other creek-dwelling fish like spotted bass and long-ear sunfish and bluegill and green sunfish and warmouth and all these all these other warm water species. Cool. Um, and how many you know how much time, how many years did you devote to exploring all of this before um, you kind of thought, hey, maybe I'll work, maybe I'll work towards putting this all together in in a volume. Uh, yeah, yeah. So before before I wrote uh, Fly Fishing Houston in, in southeastern Texas, um, I had put together a small book. It was uh, it's about eighty four pages, something like that. It's called Fly Fishing the Sam, and um, I wrote it over COVID. It was like two thousand nineteen, I think, or two thousand twenty is when it actually came out. But it was you know written in, in two thousand nineteen, and that was just kind of what I what I had written down in an outdoor journal. Like if I would go out and, you know, explore a, a, a Creek, um, I would just r- write it down. And so we moved to Houston in 2014. And so over these years, I've just been, you know, if I go out squirrel hunting or whatever, and I, I see a, a catfish or something in, in the Creek, you know, I'll write it down in, in an outdoor journal. And so I just have all these, places that I like hunting and all these places I like fishing and things like that, um, written down. And so it was just kind of over, over COVID. I was like, man, I've got, I've got like this plethora of all these little creeks that I've explored and now we're not going to be able to travel or anything like that. So, um, let's just start putting this together and, and see if we can make a book out of it. And then, and then, uh, from fly fishing the Sam, then you know I got in contact with Aaron Reed, who wrote Fly Fishing Austin and, and Central Texas, and um, uh, you know he was my editor for for Fly Fishing Houston, and um, yeah, it just kind of went from there. So I went from exploring those little creeks in the Piney Woods to then you know getting more involved with the urban stuff and and carp fishing and um, you know getting linked up with a lot of the a lot of the other local guys that are just, you know, they're just amazing fishermen and they each have like their own little niche that they enjoy. You know, you might have, you might have the guys that really like urban carp fishing. And then you might have the guys that really like big bass fishing in, in one of the local lakes. And then you have, you know, the, the guys that like Creek fishing up in the piney woods. So, you know, each, each little niche of, of, fishing has its own group of guys that just um are just killing it so cool and it was a lot of fun getting to know them and that whole community um kind of embraced you um it it looks like and sounds like and um they all contributed uh to the book in in some ways as well with photos and information and everything so yeah it was it was uh you know it was it was just a lot of fun being involved, um, with that and, and yeah, just getting to know them, uh, better and better. You know, you you know, of them, you know, you, you, you talk to them every once in a while, like there would be, we'd have, um, 
uh, we haven't had it in, in several years, but we used to have a carp tournament down here, and um, it was it was hosted by one of the guys that that um, guides in in Houston, Danny Scarborough, and so he would have this carp tournament. And so all these guys would come in, and you know you just start to get to know people and, and talk to them, and um, so yeah, it was just it was just fun to to collaborate with them. And then the way that the book is organized, um, it uh, covers a swath of fishing opportunities, um, kind of from north to south, right? Um, yeah, that's and right. And then you, you've got the, the mileage and the drive times, GPS coordinates and all that other pertinent information. Um, and you refer to the specific fisheries as wades. Yeah, that's right. Well, yeah, I, I refer to the the section that I that I'm describing in the book as as a wade. So, if I look at a watershed, and maybe I'll have you know three or four wades uh, along that one specific mm-hmm. creek. Yeah. So yeah, and you're right. You know, we we start north of the city in the in the Piney Woods region. Um, a lot of those are are creeks, and then we have we also include Lake Conroe. Uh, in there, which is you know one a massive mm-hmm. lake um, that's just north northwest of the city, um, so that's in there as well. And then, and then on this second half of the book, that's when we get into the urban stuff, like the the uh, urban concrete flats and and a couple of lakes that are actually within the city limits there. Yeah, that, I thought I thought that was cool. I hadn't really heard that term applied, um, and it makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, like there's lots of wades around here that I'll recommend for people like, yeah, go in here, walk mm-hmm. in here, fish to down here. There's your wade, right? Right. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, and as far as the book is, uh, is laid out and organized, is that, um, is that something that, uh, like Aaron Reed suggested and kind of how he mapped out his book as well? Uh, yeah. So, you know, the, the template that Aaron came up with for the, uh, with, with, um, the Imperfects Books um, publisher, um, you know, he, he kind of worked with them to help design this local angler template, I guess you could call it. And um, uh, so, yeah, it's it's a little bit different than other guidebooks where a lot of times, you know, at the, the first half of a guidebook will be a lot of intro stuff. Um, whereas we do have an intro in this guidebook, but then we go right into the wades and then, and then midway through, you know, we address some other things like proper fish handling and, um, uh, you know, how to stay safe and catch and release practices. And then in the second half, it's the urban stuff. And then at the end of the, at the end of the book, uh, we kind of have, you know, like, how do we, how do we continue to, keep our Houston waterways clean and um, how do we continue to be responsible anglers? So it's just kind of like a, a positive message to uh, wrap the book up with. Um, and as far as Houston being known as the Bayou city, um, yeah, what, right. what's your definition of a Bayou? I, I had never heard that term actually for Houston. Um, I've been there a few times. I've done a little fishing around there. I've been to um, Lake Conroe and fish some of the, uh, these like power plant lakes and stuff. It was a while ago. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. Maybe like Fayetteville or something could like be, that. Could be. It was really cool. And the bass fishing was good in the dead of winter. Um, yeah, but yeah. but uh, what's a, what is a bayou for our listeners that might not equate that to Houston? Yeah. Yeah. So a, a bayou, supposedly it's, it's uh, from like a, a Choctaw word, um, which is like, I can't remember it off the top of my head. It was like by Chuck or something like that. Um, uh, and so then I guess the French took it um, and pronounced it by you. But um, uh, all that it is, is just a slow flowing, me- like meandering body of water. And you know, it, it's oftentimes down here, at least it's, it's muddy, um, you know, or, or at least cloudy. Um, but it's, you know, there's hardly any gradient to it. You can barely tell it's moving basically. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, this this one fishery that's mentioned in here, Spring Creek, that one, that and the, um, forgive my uh, pronunciation, but is it uh, the San Jacinto? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's how you would that's how you would say it. Uh, but uh, uh, the locals call it 
the sand jack, sand jack. basically. Okay, or, easy enough. Yeah, easy enough. yeah. Uh, those look uh, really intriguing to me, um, especially uh, you know the the option to do some canoeing and uh, paddling down um, that Spring Creek. Um, yeah. Can you kind of map yeah, the, those out for me and uh, and explain, um, you know, are there uh, opportunities to do like a camping trip at all out of a canoe on those or? So the, the best waterway that you could definitely do an overnight canoe trip on would be Village Creek, um, which is, uh, that's at the, that's also at the back of the book. I have like a section called further afield. Um, and if you liked the way spring Creek looked, you know, with those, with the Sandy, um, stream bed and all that, um, village Creek is like that as well, but it's more suitable for canoeing, um, cause it's deeper. And, um, the whole length of village Creek is within the big thicket national preserve oh, cool. and you're allowed to, you're, yeah, you're allowed to camp along the banks of the big thicket. And so, um, in the summertime, I mean, it's like super popular. There's everybody and their brothers oh, is that there, right? uh, floating down it. Yeah. Yeah. So if, like if you would do an overnight, you probably want to go in, in the fall or the spring or something like that in order to, to just kind of escape the crowds. Um, but, uh, yeah, that, um, that village Creek is a, would be a great place to do an overnight canoe trip. Um, there are other camping opportunities that exist in Sam Houston National Forest. Um, but the Sam Houston National Forest is a little bit different than other national forests because it's so close to Houston that the the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department actually um, manages that whole Sam Houston National Forest area and they don't allow camping um, from September 1st to February 1st. Um, yeah, yeah, I think it's February 1st because that's all um, hunting season and they won't let you oh, gotcha. camp up there during hunting season. Um, but there are designated campgrounds that you can camp at. You know, they have designated hunter camps and they have um, camps that have more amenities like bathrooms and, and things like that. So you can do an overnight trip up there. Um, but uh, if you if you would do it, you probably should do it outside of the hunting season. Gotcha. Um, and, you know, you can canoe the length of Lake Conroe and some of those campsites are on the lake. So you could potentially just look at it and say, okay, you know, we're going we're gonna to paddle to Stubblefield Recreation Area and then camp there. And then the next day, wake up and explore that whole Stubblefield area, uh, fishing along the way. Um, also, Lone Star Hiking Trail is the longest contiguous hiking trail in mm. Texas. And it runs all, all the way through Sam Houston National Forest. Oh, cool. And so you can, you can camp along um, the Lone Star Hiking Trail as well. Oh, very nice. Awesome. Um, you also you mentioned uh there's bowfin uh in in lake conroe yeah. um and some of the other some of the other watersheds uh for you know those are super cool fish uh i've only i've only yeah. caught one of those um in a pond in florida it kind of kind of oh, surprised nice, me nice. yeah i was casting a clouser for bass and hooked this thing and it put up a great fight and you know I, yeah i was a little <laughs> yeah. afraid to grab it they've got some pretty gnarly teeth um yeah. yeah can you kind of describe those species for us and and tell us like how you target those because they're those are a blast not to be not to be overlooked they're really a fun fish to catch. yeah yeah oh yeah absolutely and i'm i'm right there with you i completely fell in love with bowfin um danny scarborough who's one of the the local guides um that guides the houston area he also guides in dallas um he's the, he's the one that showed me all about bowfin um and he actually uh, sight fishes for them so yeah. um you know there's sections of lake conroe where it's really weedy and it's shallow but it, it like it's like a shallow shelf for you know several hundred yards um and it kind of just works along this this um uh edge of the of, of the lake and you it's really weedy and so that's i found that that to be the most fun uh way to target bowfin where you're kind of in a in a uh, canoe or you're in a kayak and you're just kind of going along and you're paddling slowly and quietly and you're just looking and you'll see them laid up in the weeds um, and you know, they, they'll look like a log or, or they'll be like almost 
like smushed down in the mud and all you can see is that that telltale fin of theirs kind of protruding from the back of the mud and um uh you know some sometimes they'll eat sometimes they won't they won't like last weekend we were out it was kind of a, a cold day um we saw a bowfin laid up in the shallows and uh we just we kept putting flies in front of it and it was just sleeping or something yeah. i don't know what it was doing but it wasn't eating and uh um so you know they they might get in weird moods like that but um but during the spring, when the water starts to warm up again, um, and they, they start they, to get aggressive, um, that's when it's a lot of fun to to uh, go out there and target them. And you'll see them in the shallows, just working their way through the through the uh, the weeds and stuff like that. And they have that big, long, you know, they, some some people confuse them with with snakeheads because they have that big, long fin that wraps, you know, almost the entire way around the the back of their their tail and like you see that thing kick on and it looks like an eel it's just like undulating in the water and when they move forward like their whole body won't move and just that fin will just be like undulating back and forth and they're just hovering across the seafloor or the, the you know the lake floor and they're just looking for stuff to eat and then when they decide to move fast then they just like kick their whole whole entire uh, back fin and just go they're they're an awesome fish. They're they're so much fun. Yeah, and as you mentioned, they're they're not the same species as a snakehead, right? Yeah, right, right. No, yeah, they're they're not. Um, they're actually they're like on the orders of of ancient, you know, fish in in North America. They're like up there with with they're gar. native, correct? Um, yeah, yeah, they are. Yeah, yeah whereas correct. snakeheads are like an introduced species from Southeast Asia, I think. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, they these uh, yeah, bowfin are are completely native. They're they're there are native, you know, bad backwater fish, you know. They're Wow, they're cool. cool. Do you ever eat those? I I've never eaten them now. I wonder if they're any good. I bet they're pretty good. Yeah, I don't hmm. know. I don't know. I've I've eaten gar, you know, and, and gar is pretty good. Um so if it's anything anything like that, I I've, I've heard that they're not good, but then but you you don't you never know, you sure. know, some yeah, I've also heard that gar don't taste good, and I I like eating gar. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, some people don't like the taste of elk. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> well, those people. Yeah, are yes, they are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Those both would, um, uh Yeah, they really intrigue me. Um, and they behave the way that you describe them is uh, really similar to pike. Um, and you know, sight fishing for pike is is uh, one of my favorite activities. And then like you described too, like you mentioned, they don't always eat, you know, they're sitting there laid up and they're in moody, they're moody fish and they got to be in the mood to attack your fly. But just uh, having the opportunity to sight fish like that is super fun. Yeah. 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 It's, it's super fun. And and actually like you mentioning pike reminded me that also the, the gar tend to do that too. Also in the spring where they're like laid up, real real shallow and um you know the some of the gar they'll be together and you can see that they've started spawning and they they will not touch your fly they do not care at all they're just like they have their girl and they're just you know following and there'll be like five males or whatever following the the female around um and they just they won't touch a fly but then after they're done doing their thing or whatever then they just they'll they'll eat after that or or maybe they're not quite spawning yet or i'm not exactly sure but you know every every once in a while you put a fly in front of one that just will thrash it so yeah um speaking of gar we had um, a guy named dr ryan king who's a um he's a a fisheries professor from baylor and he also holds he also holds like the all fly tackle record for gar for one of the species of gar, I can't remember if it's alligator, <laughs> yeah. or longnose, maybe I, I don't remember. He, but you, you might go back and visit that episode. It's pretty interesting. I kind of have a, we kind of have a standing invitation to go fish with him um, when we're down in Texas, and I definitely want to take advantage of that. Oh, yeah, nice! That, that gar game looks like a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, I've seen the, the his videos. Um, yeah, where he's targeting gator gar and, and things like that. Uh, it looks it looks really really fun. There's um you know there's uh, species of, of gar all over Texas, but we do also have gator gar over on the Eastern, um, over in the Eastern 
side of the of the state around Houston, and um, the Trinity River is a pretty good river for gar fishing. Um, I didn't actually address the Trinity in much detail in the book, just because it's such a big mm-hmm. river. Um, you know, it really takes uh, power boats or, or whatever to really unlock it. But there's there's a couple of backwater sloughs that um, that are in that area that we can get into you know you're fishing like among the cypress trees and things like that that we've we've been able to get into gator gar back in back in those backwater sloughs you know there's a new song called trinity river that's on the radio by charlie crockett you have you heard oh yeah (laughs) no i I haven't heard it (laughs) but i know charlie crockett yeah yeah. yeah, you gotta check that out i'll have to check it out i heard it for the first time and sent it to uh sent it to to dr king recently uh, with the yeah, oh, nice. pretty cool. Um, My buddy Zach's probably shaking his head right now that I don't know that song, but <laughs> uh, the, have to yeah, check it check out. It out. Uh, yeah, the other thing that uh, appealed to me about this book is it, it looks like I, I I need a I don't need a, you know a, a super varied fly selection to come down there and fish. It's pretty uh, pretty simple and pretty concise selection of flies that you use. Um, I like, I like, yeah. uh, you know, the way that you laid this out and kept it kind of simple. Like, yeah, you don't need 10 different carp flies, you know, tie this bonefish bug. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A couple of options and you're good to go, which is often the case. Yeah. Yeah. With that, with that fly section in the book, I mean, there were, there are a couple of, of flies that we highlight that, that, you know, some of the, the locals tie that, that work really well like danny scarborough's brass hawk i mean that's that's a killer fly and i'll use that on on bass as well it just it mimics a, a damselfly mm. nymph um so you know it'll it'll catch just about anything that eats damselfly nymphs which is just about right. everything but um like I, I think danny's even landed bowfin on it before um but uh, uh yeah i mean you know really whenever we go out and we fish let's if we're fishing for spotted bass or largemouth and in, in one of the the local rivers or during the white bass run or something like that. We'll just bring like a mess of clousers. Just, we just know, yeah. you know, everything eats a clouser. They're <laughs> easy to tie. You can lose a dozen of them in a day and, you know, be able to tie that many again that night. So um, just usually, usually the clousers like one of the go-to patterns that we use, especially if we're fishing the rivers. Yeah. You can't go wrong there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it's a great pattern too for you know you, if you need to get deep uh, or if you you know want to strip it fast and, and kind of a, a shallow run or something like that or even dead drift it like a like a dead shad you know floating down the down the um, uh, or not floating but you know just rolling sure. through the yeah, water just column dead there it, right yeah yeah um, what is the difference between a spotted bass and a largemouth? Oh yeah, so um, uh, this this was something that I really didn't know until moving down here. You know, when I, we were up in Pennsylvania, it was all smallmouth and largemouth. Um, but uh, spotted bass, spotted bass are kind of our creek dwelling, um, uh, ultra light tackle fish that it's just like a blast on when you're up fishing in, in the piney woods region a uh, spotted bass will also live in reservoirs but um for whatever reason they they prefer flow that is a little bit too swift for a hmm. large mouth so in a lot of the piney woods creeks um uh you'll find them in like a, a sandy creek uh just below like a riffle or you know i've, I've even um hooked them while check nymphing through a, a riffle you know with a with a jig head nymph just like the same way you would check nymphing sure. and i was able to hook into spotted bass doing that um but yeah so they're they they don't get as large as as a large mouth um but they're still a really cool fish they've got spots all along their belly um they're bug eaters so they eat a lot of dragonfly nymphs damselfly nymphs um uh, they'll eat crayfish uh, you know, in the largemouth and spotted bass uh, habitat often overlap. So, you know, you might catch those two different species out of the same hole um, uh, in the piney woods or something like that. Um, but they're, they tend to be more in, in the creeks than, say, the largemouth. So they're kind of like 
are little like blue lining um, creek dwelling oh, that's fish. Cool. Yeah, so I, I just I just really like them for that reason. Yeah, and then um, I didn't I wasn't privy to the yellow bass either. Um, oh right, yeah, yeah. That's a, another temperate species, um, kind of like the white bass, but the yellow bass. The yellow bass is native to the eastern half of Texas. It doesn't really extend much further west than I think it extends west of the Brazos, but it it definitely you definitely don't get them um, once you get west of the Balcones Escarpment, which is like the Austin area. Um, so they're they're kind of like on the eastern half of the state. They're they're a native fish to the eastern half. Um, and and they'll, you'll catch them with with white bass during the white bass run. They'll be running up there doing the same thing the white bass are running up in the creeks to spawn. Cool. Um, so you can catch them then too. And they they don't get as big as a white bass though, but uh, you know still super fun. They're really like tall sure. fish, you know, so that they've got like tall shoulders mm, on them. They're pretty. Yeah, they are pretty. Um, yeah, they're they're gorgeous. And then the other fish that I'm really curious about is the freshwater drum. Um. Oh sure, yeah. yeah. The Gasper goo, Ga- yeah. or the goo. <laughs> Gasper goo. I love that name. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a lot of the a lot of the goos that we catch are a lot of like bycatches. Um, so uh, I know that you know over in in the Lano and and places where the water is a bit clearer, um, you can see them work in the the bottom, and you can sight uh, fish for them over there. In in our waterways it's kind of hard to, to see them um, just because we have a little bit, you know, we have more sediment in our, in our water and it's a little bit more tannic. Um, so, you know, during the white bass run or whenever you're fishing for, for spotted bass or large mouth or something like that in the, in the rivers, that's usually when you get into them. And it's usually like when you're stripping a clouser or, or a heavily weighted fly along the bottom. Um, that tends to be whenever they, they'll hit it. They like, they like slow retrieves, hmm. you know? Um, so they, they'll, they'll oftentimes hit your fly if you're just kind of bumping it on the bottom slowly. Gotcha. But that's another really strong fish. I mean, you know, it's, it's related to the red drum and all that. So, you know, it's, it's a strong, it's a strong pooler. Awesome. Well, Hey, uh, how can folks, uh, reach you and, uh, where's the best way to buy your book? I, I know they have it in fly shops, um, in the, in the region and, but, uh, where can folks pick a copy of this up? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the book comes out, uh, February 7th, but you can, you can pre-order now on Amazon. You can get it on uh, Barnes and Noble, uh, pretty much anywhere that, you know, you can buy books. Yep. Yeah, uh, for my my contact information, um, you can reach me on social media uh, on, on Instagram. It's um, uh, at Fly Fishing the Sam, uh, and also own a little website called FlyFishingTheSam.com, which I started whenever uh, I wrote my first book, uh, Fly Fishing the Sam. So um, you can email me through there as well. But yeah. Uh, February 7th is when Fly Fishing Houston in Southeastern Texas comes out. So, um, you know, you can pre-order it now, though, on Amazon if you want. Cool. And then uh, before I let you go, um, what do you think is the biggest misconception about fly fishing in Houston? Oh, that <laughs> definitely that there aren't fish here. Um, I think that would be that would be the, the biggest misconception. Um, it's you could you could only go fishing twice a year and save it for you know your your annual trip to the mountains or you could basically fish every weekend if you wanted to Um, you just have to you just kind of have to to look at the water a little differently and um and just realize that there are fish everywhere in these in these bayous down here you could fish for grass carp in the concrete flats um, or you could go up to the piney woods and fish for spotted bass and, and long ear sunfish, um, or go to one of the lakes and, and fish for bass there. So, um, uh, you know, Houston's a huge city. It's the fourth largest city in the, in the country. Um, and it's getting bigger. I mean, demographers project it to, that'll be, it'll be bigger than uh, Chicago in the next couple of wow. years. And so, yeah. So, you know, with that, we get more people coming down. Um, you know, people moving in from California and, and things like that. And 
they don't have to hang up the fly rod basically if if you're moving here from out of state you know if you're coming from if you're coming from a place that you used to be able to fish for trout and you're assuming that your fishing days are done that's just that's just not the case you're not going to be fishing for trout but you're gonna be fishing for all different kinds of species that pull really hard and, and are just as much fun to fish for yeah the diversity of uh, of the you know quarry that you have around there just re is really impressive and, and looking through the book it uh it's kind of um rekindled my interest in in coming down there and doing some more exploring so uh, the next time that we're heading for texas for a show or whatever yeah, please I'm, gonna, let me know. I'm gonna look you up so don't in, don't okay. invite us because lauren and i will show up on your doorstep <laughs> okay <laughs> all right no please do yeah we'll, we'll figure out a day that would be a That'd lot of be fun great man all right the book is called fly fishing houston in southeastern texas and uh thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today robert and uh good luck um good luck with the book and uh yep thank you and uh, we'll catch you down the road Go to thefebruaryroom.com where you can access a complete library of our podcast and read more about our guests, their fishing stories, and favorite fly patterns. We're always looking for exceptional fly fishing yarns, and if you have one to spin, shoot us an email at info at thefebruaryroom.com. The February Room is always free, but if you feel like throwing a nickel in the pond, we appreciate any additional listener support. For companies and individuals interested in sponsorship opportunities, please contact us for our media kit. Thanks for stopping by the February Room, and we'll see you down here next week.